And you can take your Bibles, if you've got them tonight, and turn to the very small little book of Lamentations. And so, if you can find the big books of Isaiah and Jeremiah, Lamentations is right at the end of Jeremiah. And uh, Lamentations chapter 3 tonight, not every day goes the way we plan it or the way we want it to. Not every day is a good day. And uh, two weeks ago, I saw it was August 9th, it was a Tuesday morning. And people up in Wisconsin were going to work that Tuesday morning, just like they did five days a week on I-94. They'd gotten up and hit the highway, headed into work and, and all of that. And that particular morning, there was a flatbed trailer that was going down that highway, and it was carrying a bunch of stuff on the back. And as the trailer was going down, the straps holding everything broke loose, and everything that was on the trailer came off the trailer. And all the stuff they, was car- they were carrying was on these pallets that were on rollers. And so when the stuff fell off the trailer, it was just rolling down the highway as people were going around driving there on their morning drive to work. But what that trailer was hauling was porta potties. And so that morning on the way to work, there's all these porta potties rolling down the highway as people are trying to get to work. And initially, some people said, We saw these things rolling and thought, Surely that's not a porta potty. They just went rolling past me. But it was. But then people began to swerve and it caused a big traffic jam and people were in all kinds of wrecks. And that was not the way people wanted to start their morning. It was not the best day. The book of Lamentations is all because Jeremiah is not having good days. Jeremiah. It's called the weeping prophet. The reason for that is that he was preaching to the people and he was telling them, if you don't repent and turn to God, God is going to allow judgment to come. He's going to allow us to be conquered and ultimately carried off into captivity. And the book of Lamentations is after that has happened. Jeremiah saw the fulfillment of his own prophecies. The people ignored him. They did not listen to him. In fact, many times they mocked him and made fun of him. And because they did that, God did allow the Babylonians to come and they encircled the city of Jerusalem and they besieged it and tore down the walls and burned down the temple and set the, set the buildings and the homes on fire and carried off thousands of people into captivity. And Jeremiah had to watch all of that with his own eyes. He had to watch as his own home and his own city and his, his own family were burned and persecuted and people carried off into slavery. And he had to watch that. And he writes a book of Lamentations, and it is just that. It is a lament. It is a, a sorrowful book as he's writing about all the things that he's had to see happen. And then he begins to talk about the point in this book where he turns to say how he wants to look at these bad days. And he says in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22, he simply says this, "...through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed." Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Jeremiah got to a point, he said, even in the middle of this bad day that's going on and all of these things happening, he said, still, every morning God's mercy is there and every morning his faithfulness is true. Great is thy faithfulness. Are you glad God is good today just like he was yesterday and will be tomorrow? And so that's what I want to talk about tonight is just simply this, every day. I want to look at that every day. He said, every day great is thy faithfulness. And so we see the Bible says a lot about the mornings and the days that we have. First, we see that every morning for 40 years, manna came down from heaven. And that tells us that every morning we need to start not by being fed on food alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The best way to start our day, the breakfast of champion is not Wheaties, it's the word of God. Amen. Every morning that manna came down from heaven. Every morning we should feast on God's word. Every morning the priests went and they stirred the fire on the altar. Every morning they would go and take their pokers and stir that fire to get it stirred up for the day. In the same way Paul tells us to stir up the gift of God that's in us. Every morning we get up, we need to stir up that flame in us, the Holy Spirit inside of us. And every morning... There was an offering laid on that altar. Every morning they sacrificed an offering. And in the same way, the Bible says that we are to present ourselves a living sacrifice. Every morning we get up to God, we ought to say, Here I am, Lord. I am your sacrifice today, and I lay myself on the altar for you. And so we look today at every day. One of the verses that sticks out to me when it comes to every day is a song that, or a psalm that uh, we've actually turned into a song. I remember singing growing up as a kid, and it's this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. We sung that as a chorus growing up, but it comes out of Psalm chapter 118. And as you know, psalms were not just written for us to read. Psalms were a book of hymns. And in your pews, you've got hymn books sitting right in front of you. And those are hymns that we've grown up singing. And and the Psalms was the hymnal of the Israelites. They sang these Psalms. And certain Psalms were meant for certain particular days. For example, we sing happy birthday when somebody's having a birthday. We don't just randomly sing happy birthday on any day, but when somebody's having a birthday. We don't normally sing Silent Night in June, and we don't normally sing, uh, you know, patriotic songs in December. We know there are certain times for certain songs. 
And in the same way when it came to the Psalms, Psalms chapter 113 through 118 were saying at the Passover meal. Psalms 113 and 114 were sung before the meal, and 115 and 118 were sung after the meal. They sang them in an order. And the scripture tells us that the last meal that we call the Last Supper, when Jesus met with the disciples, they evidently sang those first two psalms, and he washed their feet, and they had the meal, and then they sang the last few. And the scripture says, and when they were finished, they sang a hymn as they departed to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that hymn would have been Psalm chapter 118, what I just quoted. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know who's playing with the lights, but <laughs> they're not playing with it. We're having trouble back there with the breaker box. But, um, but Psalms 118, I want you to think about that. The last thing that they sing at that Passover supper is this is the day the Lord has made. We'll be rejoice and be glad in it as they're headed to the Garden of Gethsemane. The last thing that Jesus sings before he heads to that place where he's going to be betrayed, where he heads to that place where he's going to be arrested, where he knows he's going to be beaten, his beard is going to be ripped out, he's going to be whipped on his back, a crown of thorns in his head, ultimately nails in his hands. And yet Jesus says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, if Jesus can find even in a day like that a reason to rejoice, I think we need to find a reason to rejoice every day. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So I want you to know, first of all, tonight that every day is a provided day. He said, this is the day the Lord has made. And that word made that is used here in that verse, that word made is the same word that is used in the book of Genesis when it says God made the heavens and the earth. When it says God made those animals that fly and the animals of the sea and the animals of the land. When it says God made male and female and they were created in his image. That's what it says when it says God made this day. Have you ever thought about that before? To watch a craftspeople who make things. I've seen people that worked with stained glass and people who did woodworking and people who did other things like that. And to watch the intricate detail and how much effort they put into something that they're making. Listen, God made you and me. I mean, he scooped up some dust from the earth and he made man and woman and breathed into us the breath of life. He made the mountains and the oceans and the stars and the planets and all of these things. And in that same way, he made today. He fashioned it. He crafted every day that we get up as a day that God has made. And it is something that has a purpose to it because God doesn't make anything without a purpose. Now, I don't think anything is made without a purpose. I do think the closest you can get to it are mosquitoes. I haven't found a purpose for those yet, but everything God makes has a purpose and today has a purpose and every day we get up has a purpose i want you to get that in your minds every morning you wake up and god puts breath in your lungs and a beat in your heart there is a reason for us to be here god has a purpose and we need to get up and say this is the day that was not just an accident this wasn't just some random day stuck on the counter this is the day god has formed and crafted and made and there is a purpose to it the second thing we see from this is that every day is a precious day. He said, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. We should not uh, look at any days as bad days. You know, I know some people dread Mondays and, and then they've got that phrase, TGIF, thank God it's Fridays. But can I tell you, Mondays are just as good as Fridays and Sundays are just as good as Saturday because every day is the day God has made. Every day is an, is an opportunity to worship and serve the Lord. And we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. You know, it's, it takes some training to begin to find some good in every single day. I remember um, one day I was out in the yard in the, a couple of months ago and working on some stuff and things weren't going like I wanted and things were breaking and not starting and little by little and I was, I was beginning to grumble and complain about everything that was going on. And I, you know, said, Lord, I, I'm kind of irritated this isn't working. I've got all this stuff to do and I need to be doing this to the house. And then I stopped and said, but, you know, thank you that I've got a house. And maybe things aren't going like I wanted them to, but thank you that I've got these things. And maybe they're not going the way I want them to, but thank you that I have the health and the strength to do it. And thank you that you've given me this. And, th and it didn't take too long that you can, you can worship your way out of a negative attitude. Take, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And so he says there, this is the day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us stop having a negative attitude and looking at all the things that are wrong and start praising for God for the things that are right. Here's the third thing he said, and that is that every day is a planned day. If he had created this day, then he has a plan for this day. Job chapter 14 says, His days are determined, the number of his months is with you. Talking about mankind. All of us, our days are determined, the number of our months are with God. Psalm chapter 90, Moses said this, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I was thinking the other day, and 
looking at a countdown and I was looking at this countdown. It was telling us how many days until something coming up. And, and I thought, you know what, if, what if we had a countdown on our lives? God knows our last day on earth. He knows that we don't, but he does. He knows how many days are left. We don't know that, but Moses prayed there in that Psalm chapter 9, teach us to number our days. Teach me to know that today I've got one less day than I had yesterday. And tomorrow I'm going to have one less day than I have today. And so because of that, every day is a planned day. God has something for us to do. And every day, we don't have to decide what it is. We just have to submit to what God has already got planned. Do you know that? Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. That should be our heart every morning that we get up. God, not my will today. I don't want to do anything that's my plan. I want to submit to your plan and let you have your way in my heart and in my life. And we can do that when we trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not in our own understanding, but acknowledge him in all our ways. And he shall direct our paths every day, the plan that he has for us. Here's the next thing he says, and that is that every day, I know this is going to sound a little elementary, kind of almost too simple to even point out, but every day is a present day. Today is today. I don't have to live tomorrow today and I don't have to live yesterday today. And that's why so many people have a hard time dealing with today and, and being joyful today because they're always either living in tomorrow or yesterday. So many people are already living in tomorrow and they're bringing that in worry about what if tomorrow, what if this, what if that, or they're living in the regrets and the, and the things that have to do with yesterday. And that's why the Bible tells us today is a present day. This is the day the Lord has made. Yesterday is done and gone and tomorrow isn't even here yet. So let's live for today. Let me tell you what the Bible says about dealing with the yesterdays and tomorrows. Number one, we need to deal with yesterday's grief. You know, sometimes people have grief that happened a long time ago or maybe some time ago and they're not able to let go of that pain. The Bible does not ever say that we have no sorrow. I wish it did. I say many times when I preach funerals, if I could change one punctuation point in the whole Bible, it would be where Paul said, we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. I wish I could move the period to tell every believer, we do not sorrow, period. But that's not what it says. It says we do sorrow, but we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Listen, if you've got some grief from yesterday, I'm not saying it doesn't still hurt, but I'm saying we don't have to deal with a sorrow that has no hope. Through the tears, we can look into the hope that know that Jesus is coming and heaven is going to make things right, and so we can deal with yesterday's grief. We can also deal with yesterday's grudges. You know, some people never can let go of the hurts of yesterday. They just can't do it. Somebody hurt me, somebody said something, somebody did something, and I just can't let go of that. I can't deal with that. And they continue to carry that grudge on, and I've known people who've carried grudges for years and years and years. You know what the sad part about that is that grudge doesn't hurt the other person at all. It only hurts the person carrying the grudge. You might say, but how is it possible to deal? If somebody has hurt me that bad, how can I just completely let it go? I'll tell you, here's what Paul said. He said, God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. You know what we can do? We can say, God, you're better at dealing with people than I am. I'm going to let it go. I can forgive them and leave it with you to trust that you know how to handle it better than I know how to handle it. You might say, but... I just don't know. I've been hurt so bad. I just don't know that I can ever truly forgive. You know what the scripture says? With God, all things are possible. You might say, I could never forgive them. Well, let me just challenge you to do this. You pray and ask God to help you forgive them. And I bet God can help you do it. He can help us do that. To get over yesterday's grudges. And then there's yesterday's guilt. Some people can't get over what they did yesterday. Last month, last year, 10 years ago. They say, I know what I was. I know what I did. And those things, even though I believe I'm saved now, those things haunt me and the devil torments me with that. Paul said simply this. He said, therefore, putting behind those things that are behind me and stretching forward to the prize that is ahead. You know what? When we get saved, we can't go back and do anything about the past, but we can do the best to make our future the brightest that it can be for the Lord. And so to let go of those, those guilts in the past and say, I am not the man I used to be. I have been washed in the blood, forgiven and changed, and God can take care of all of those things. I don't have to carry that, uh, that guilt around with me anymore. And here's another one that's a challenge, and, and this is kind of an odd one to think of, but some people can't get over yesterday's glory. And what I mean by that is they never get over the idea of thinking yesterday is better than today. They live in that phrase, the good old days. You know, well, back then, that was the good old days. And they begin to romanticize and think that yesterday was so much better than today. But I want to tell you what the Bible says. It says, why were the former days better than these? That's what Ecclesiastes says. It simply says this, that God tells us, he said he can do a new thing. 
I want to tell you what, let us never be people who look over our past saying the best was back there. Let us always be people who say, you know what, with God the best is yet to come. He can do something greater in the future than he's ever done before. Do you believe that? Do you believe that we can have a greater revival in our future than we've ever had before? That God can do incredible things in the future? And so we need to let go of those things. And so here's why I tell you that we need to not worry about tomorrow. Those are the things of the past, but now let me tell you why we shouldn't worry about tomorrow. Number one, we don't even know that we'll still be here tomorrow. The Bible says that our life is a vapor that's here for a moment and gone. We don't know that maybe uh, tonight in our sleep, maybe our heart stops beating and we don't wake up in the morning. Or even better than that, how about this, that the trumpet sounds today and we're not here tomorrow. So why worry about tomorrow when we may not even be here tomorrow? Why worry about stuff we may not even have to face the second reason we shouldn't worry about tomorrow is that tomorrow's problem may not even be there when we get there. I've told you many times before, but on Easter Sunday morning, those women walking to the tomb and they're arguing among themselves, what are we going to do? We saw those soldiers put that stone in place. We know how many thousands of pounds it was. How are we going to move that stone when we get there? And all the way to the tomb, they were saying, who's going to roll that stone away when we get there? But when they got there, how many know that stone was already rolled away? God had already tossed that stone on the other side of the garden. And what they've been worrying about all that way wasn't even there when they got there. The same is true so many times. We worry about things and we finally get there to realize that it's not even... What we thought happened wouldn't even happen. Here's a third reason we don't need to worry about tomorrow. And that is that God does not give us tomorrow's strength until tomorrow. That's what the Bible says. As your days, so shall your strength be. Every day God has an allotment of strength for that day. And He does not give me Thursday's strength on Wednesday. He'll give me tomorrow's strength tomorrow. When you face tomorrow, He'll give you the strength to take care of it. Paul wasn't sure that he could do it. He said, Lord, I've got this thorn. You've got to take it. And God said, Paul, I'm going to make you a promise. He said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. Sufficient means enough. How many know God's grace is enough? God will give us enough grace to get through today. And tomorrow he'll have a whole new load of supply of grace for tomorrow. So he says, we don't need to worry about those. Instead, he said, he takes care of things one day at a time. That's why Jesus said, pray. This is, he said, to pray for our daily bread. God, just take care of me today. Tomorrow when I get there, I'll pray for you to take care of tomorrow. Here's the last thing, and that is that every day is a passing day. I was curious about it, so I found out there's a website where you can go in and you can plug in the day you were born, and it'll look up what today is, and it'll tell you exactly how many days that you have lived. And so today I am 16,004 days old. Today I am 16,004 days old. Tomorrow I'll be 16,005 days old. And you know, most of those days have been very different. Most of them have been completely different. Very few of them are ever the same. But there's one thing consistent about every single one of them, and that is for 16,003 days, every one of those days have come to an end. And this one's going to come to an end in a few hours. And so every day God gives us is a passing day. We have an opportunity. Every day is an opportunity to do something for the Lord. That's why Jesus said, he said, the hour is coming when we won't be able to work. The sun is setting. He was saying, you're running out of time. The clock is spinning. The sand is running through the hourglass. He said, we're running out of time. This is a passing day. Let's make the most of it and do something for the Lord. Yet there were people in the scripture who procrastinated. There was a procrastinating mob in Genesis when Noah preached for a hundred years and said, get your hearts ready, but they put it off and put it off till it was too late. There were the procrastinating monarchs of Pharaoh in the Old Testament who procrastinated and wouldn't get his heart right. And Felix in the New Testament, Paul, go away. I'll call for you when I have a more convenient time. They never got their hearts right with God. There was a procrastinating man called Judas who did what he knew was wrong, but instead of returning and repenting, he waited until it was too late and he messed it up because instead of getting things right with God, he waited until it was too late. Today is a passing day. Let's not, let's not waste this day, but let's make the most of every opportunity. Let me tell you tonight, uh, as we begin to close, let's not use the phrase, one of these days. Sometimes people say, well, you know, one of these days I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something for the Lord. One of these days I'm going to serve. One of these days I'm going to be more faithful. One of these days I'm going to do something for my family. One of these days I'm going to send a card to that person. One of these days I'm going to call them. One of these days I'm going to pray. Let's not be one of those people. Let's say, today I'm going to do it. Today I'm going to do whatever I can for the Lord, because tomorrow I may be standing in His presence. And so we understand today is a passing day, so we want to live every day to its fullest. Would you stand right where you're at and close your eyes for just a second and just let me say again, this is the day. Jeremiah said, great is thy faithfulness every morning. His mercies are new every single morning. Every morning we get up. This is the day God has crafted and made on purpose. This is the day that God has given us as a gift and as an opportunity. 
So let us make a determination. We will not live in the worry of tomorrow. We will not live looking over our shoulder into the past, but every day rejoice in the day God has given us and to make the most of every opportunity. As they start some music back there in just a moment, I'm going to have us come and I'm